This devotional address with Raquel Richards was given on February 9, 2016. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our devotional. We're pleased to have Sister Raquel Richards, a professor in the Department of Nutrition, Dietetics, and Food Sciences, as our speaker this morning. We extend a special welcome to her family members and friends who are here. Sister Richards currently teaches undergraduate courses in introductory nutrition, community nutrition, and life cycle nutrition. Her current research focuses on community nutrition with special emphasis in domestic food insecurity issues. Professor Richards earned her Bachelor of Science in Nutrition Science at Utah State University, a Master's Degree of Public Health, of Public Health from Tulane University, and a PhD in Human Nutrition from the University of Minnesota. During the middle of her undergraduate education, Sister Richards served in the Germany, Germany Munich mission. She is the youngest of five children and currently serves as the Relief Society president in her ward. And now we'll be pleased to hear from Sister Raquel Richards. So as a young girl, one of my favorite primary songs was My Fa Heavenly Father Loves Me because I can imagine all the beautiful creations of God in that song, hearing the song of a bird, looking at the blue sky, having eyes to see the color of butterfly wings, and feeling the wind as it rushes by. Throughout my life, I have lived and traveled to places that have allowed me to experience different beauties of the earth, including various landscapes and cultures. Beyond the physical beauties of the earth, God has given us other beauties to help strengthen us and to bring us joy. Today, I want to share four beauties of the earth with you. One, the beauty of education. Coming to BYU was a whole new experience for me because I never attended Brigham Young University as a student. Starting as a faculty member at BYU, I quickly realized there was a unique culture all its own that existed at BYU. I remember the first time someone mentioned meeting at the Swicket. I thought to myself, what is a Swicket? I'm happy to report that since that time, I have discovered that the Swicket and many other campus building pronunciations and BYU lingo. Not having attended a religious university before, the idea of combining spiritual learning into a secular classroom was foreign to me. Through the help of my faculty in my department, new faculty seminars, and practice, I've come to treasure the beauty of bringing spiritual insights into a classroom setting. Through the past several years of being at BYU, I have been blessed to read and to listen to incredible, inspiring stories that are the foundation of this institution. Many miracles occurred throughout the history of this university that have helped me catch the vision that embodies BYU. Let me recount one of these stories. During the era of the Great Depression, like many areas of the United States, BYU was impacted by this part of history. In a BYU magazine several years ago, the following was published about this time, quote, the university wrestled with its own financial challenges, including a 22.5% pay cut for faculty and the recurrent threat of closure. Yet partly because most church junior colleges had closed by 1933, BYU enrollments increased 50% during the 1930s. By using federal grant money to fund hundreds of campus jobs and by reaching out in other ways, Faculty and administrators did what they could to help students who struggled. In 1931, when Wilford Lee first registered at BYU, he recalled, the school was struggling. They were still accepting gallon jugs of black strap molasses from the Dixie student as part payment on the student's tuition. I will always remember the why as a poor man's school. And since I was one of the poorest of the poor, I will always remember those days as a real struggle for existence." End quote. Now, I'm guessing none of you paid for your tuition this year with molasses. But my hope is that this story gives you a glimpse of the impressive history of this university and the sacrifices made by students, faculty, and administration to keep it thriving. While at BYU, I hope you will cherish the opportunities given to you, which are unique to this university. I hope you catch the vision of BYU. The most important educator we have in this life is the Holy Ghost. One of my favorite scriptures in the New Testament is when Christ teaches his apostles that once he departed this earth life, he would provide them with another comforter that may abide with them forever. Because of this other comforter, the Holy Ghost, we can receive guidance to know the path we should take in life. If we are willing to do all we can to pursue our dreams and then put our trust in God, 
to take us on the path that he knows will lead to our greatest growth, we will be where God knows we need to be to become the person he intends for us to become. Before coming to BYU, I'm guessing like many of you, I had decisions before me as to which major to choose in college and eventually what to do with my life after graduation. I am thankful for prayer and inspiration that came through the Holy Ghost. And when answers did not come in the time I had hoped for and knowing what path to pursue, I learned to rely on faith and trust in God that whatever decision I moved forward with, he would guide me differently if that path was not the one I should take. In my undergraduate years, I initially started out in one major. However, into my second year, after receiving C average grades in a couple of courses in my major, I thought that I should be doing better in my major. I began seeking other avenues. In the University Career Center, I searched through a book for potential career options. I stumbled across a description of a pediatric nutritionist. I became more excited as I read and felt that this might be my answer. I recall taking a nutrition course in high school and thoroughly enjoying the class. After meeting with the academic counselor for nutrition science, I decided to switch majors. Given my current faculty position, you can probably guess that this major stuck. The course content was exciting to study, and I felt like I couldn't wait to learn more in each class. Looking back, I have been able to identify what made the difference, and this realization is the advice I share with students when they mention trying to decide on a major. Find your passion, and then work hard at it. Most aspiring graduates will recognize this all too familiar question. What are you going to do after you graduate? Sometimes it can be scary to think of what's next, but if we have an open mind and heart, God can lead us to great things. During my master's program work, I had an opportunity to intern at a federal public health agency and thoroughly enjoyed the work and the excitement of the, the impact that work could have on the individuals across the nation. During my doctoral program, I had every intention of applying for employment at this agency, keeping my contacts active within the division I worked in as an intern. However, God had different plans for me. I knew that if I was offered a faculty position at BYU, this is where God wanted me to be. Obviously, BYU extended me the job, and I accepted. This is just one of many experiences I've had in my life where when I am willing to accept the Lord's will and listen, He has guided my, me to the path that is best for me. He does this for all of us. Christ taught, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. All that is required of us is to ask, to listen, and to accept his timing. Two, the beauty of God's creations. Over the many years of studying nutrition, I have come to stand in awe at God's creations. He truly has given us a gift of a mortal body and beauties on this earth to sustain and strengthen it. Food is one of those beauties. Not only does it give us life, but God has created it in a way that is for our enjoyment and pleasure. This last year, as I was reading the Doctrine and Covenants, a series of scriptures stuck out in my mind that I know I've read before, but took on a different meaning when I read it this time. They state, quote, All things which come of the earth and the season thereof are made for the benefit and the use of man, both to please the eye and to gladden the heart for taste and for smell, to strengthen the body and to enliven the soul." End quote. This concept is one I aim to teach my students. Food is wonderful and truly something to rejoice in. The colors and textures and variety make food pleasing to the eye and can truly gladden our hearts. The nutrients that food provides strengthen and enliven us. In the Book of Mormon, we learn that men are that they might have joy. God created us so that we could have joy on this earth. However, at times, life brings challenges that may make it seem hard to find joy. A few years ago at a Ward Relief Society activity, a panel of women in varying life stages and situations were asked to answer a series of questions. One of those questions was whether their life turned out as they had planned. Regardless of age or situation, their experiences affirmed that life rarely turns out as we had planned or anticipated. I have come to better understand that despite what we might consider setbacks or disappointments, God wants us to find joy where we currently are in life and to recognize that he has a plan tailored designed for us. Finding joy in our current circumstances is a message that President Dieter F. Uchtdorf recently taught. He said, quote, Everyone's situation is different, and the details of each life are unique. Nevertheless, I have learned that there is something that would take away the bitterness that may come into our lives. There is one thing we can do to make life sweeter, more joyful, even glorious. 
we can be grateful. It might sound contrary to the wisdom of the world to suggest one who is burdened with sorrow should give thanks to God. But those who set aside the bottle of bitterness and lift instead the goblet of gratitude can find a purifying, purifying drink of healing, peace, and understanding. Our loving Heavenly Father knows that choosing to develop a spirit of gratitude will bring us true joy and great happiness. But some might say, what do I have to be grateful for when my world is falling apart? Perhaps focusing on what we are grateful for is the wrong approach. Could I suggest that we see gratitude as a disposition, a way of life that stands independent of our current situation? In other words, I'm suggesting that instead of being thankful for things, we focus on being thankful in our circumstances, whatever they may be." End quote. Finding joy in our circumstances may seem difficult at times, but as President Uchtdorf taught, we can still find an attitude of gratitude at these times. Some may ask, how is this possible? President Uchtdorf further teaches us that being grateful in times of distress does not mean that we are pleased with our circumstances, but, through, but that through the eyes of faith we look beyond our present day challenges and recognize that even if we do not always understand the trials we are facing, we can still put our trust in God that one day we will. Through personal experience, I have learned that when we do not feel that attitude of gratitude that President Uchtdorf talked about, we can pray to God for his help in seeing beyond today or a particular moment. We can ask for God's help in opening our eyes and hearts to help us find an attitude of gratitude so that we can better endure the trials that are bound to come. Three, the beauty of scriptures and modern day prophets. The first recollection I have of reading the scriptures on my own was when I was about seven or eight years of age. At the time, we lived in a house in which the living room had bookshelves that were covered one wall. Although many books were out of my reach because of my height, I remember some, including the children's version of the scriptures, being placed within my reach. I came to thoroughly enjoy the graphics and stories of the prophets and Savior that were told. Since that time, I have again and again come to treasure the words of the scriptures. A few years ago, I felt a strong desire to reread all the standard works. At that time, I did not realize that God was preparing me for something yet to come. I began with the Doctrine and Covenants and learned new insights that I had not considered before. I can truly say that I came to better understand the idea of feasting on the words of Christ. Every day I was thrilled to read more and rekindled my testimony of the Savior and of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Shortly after starting the study of the Doctrine and Covenants, I was called to teach a youth Sunday school class. And to my surprise, which of the standard works were they studying that year? Yes, the Doctrine and Covenants. I knew that it was not by coincidence that I felt inclination to read the Doctrine and Covenants at that particular moment. If we allow him to, God directs our lives and prepares us for what is yet to come. After finishing the Doctrine and Covenants, I turned to the New Testament and then the Old Testament, which I am currently reading. I remember thinking as I read certain passages in the Old Testament that the Savior I'd come to learn about and love through the Book of Mormon and New Testament was the same being of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Stronger than any time before, I made connections between the doctrines and principles and the standard works, and my testimony and knowledge of Jesus Christ expanded. During this time, I also pondered how difficult my life would be without the scriptures. I was reminded of a time long ago when people did not have access to the scriptures in their own language to read them on their own. Elder M. Russell Ballard related the events of that time in history, quote, the dark ages were dark because the light of the gospel was hidden from the people. They did not have the apostles or prophets, nor did they have access to the Bible. The clergy kept the scriptures secret and unavailable to the people. We owe much to the many brave martyrs and reformers like Martin Luther, John Calvin, and John Huss, who demanded freedom to worship and common access to the holy books. Men like John Wycliffe, the courageous William Tyndale, and Johannes Gutenberg were prompted against much opposition to translate the Bible into language people could understand and to publish it in books people could read. I believe even the scholars of King James had spiritual promptings in their translation work. Because of the efforts of the reformers, the Bible became a household possession. The word of God was read around the family fireside of the lowly, as well as the parlors of the great." End quote. We are truly blessed to have access to ancient scriptures, but also to living prophets and apostles who teach us God's words every six months. We have a wealth of knowledge and resources literally at our fingertips. What could fill shelves and shelves of bookcases 
we now hold in the palm of our hand. On this subject, Elder D. Todd Christofferson taught, quote, Consider the magnitude of our blessing to have the Holy Bible and some 900 additional pages of scriptures, including the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Then consider that in addition, the words of prophets spoken as they are moved upon by the Holy Ghost, which the Lord calls scriptures, flow into us almost constantly by television, radio, internet, satellite, CD, DVD, and in print. I suppose that never in history has a people been so blessed with such a quantity of holy writ. And not only that, but every man, woman, and child may possess and study his or her own personal copy of these sacred texts, most in his or her own language." End quote. As Elder Christofferson reminded us, we have easier access to church doctrine than ever before. However, with this abundance, I think this council applies, where much is given, much is required. We are so blessed to have readily available resources to access scriptures, general conference talks, and much more. But do we utilize it to its full potential? Do we truly cherish what it has to offer us? Alma counseled Helaman, speaking of the Liahona that Lehi and his family used to journey through the wilderness to the promised land. He said, quote, For behold, it is as easy to give heed to the word of Christ, which will point you a straight course to eternal bliss, as it was for our fathers to give heed to this compass, which should point unto them a straight course to the promised land. And now I say, is there not a type in this thing? For just as surely as this director did bring our fathers by following its course to the promised land, shall the words of Christ, if we follow their course, carry us beyond this veil of sorrow into a far better land of promise. O oh, my son, do not let us be slothful because of the easiness of the way. For so it was with our father, for so it was prepared for them, that if they would look, they might live. Even so it is with us. The way is prepared, and if we will look, we may live forever." End quote. I know that if we sincerely look at the marvelous resources available to us through ancient and modern scriptures, we will find Christ. We will truly be able to live a joyous life now on this earth and into the eternity. Christ brings us life, and his words bring us to him. We look to the scriptures and prophets just as Nephi and his family had to look for the words on the Liahona to guide them to the promised land. As we look to the scriptures and the prophets, we will stay on the straight and narrow path that leads to God, and he will help us to become the son or daughter he intends for us to become. We have been given the opportunity to find the truthfulness of the scriptures and prophets for ourselves. We do not need to rely on others to learn of Christ and his teachings. We have been given a promise that if we ask with a sincere heart and with real intent, he will manifest the truth of his words unto us. We can each know for ourselves that is truly beautiful. For the beauty of temples. The temple is the house of the Lord, a place of love and beauty. To me, the temple is also a symbol of power and peace. As most of you know here, not too long ago, the beloved Provo City Tabernacle was burned. The sadness of the community was real, while when President Monson announced rebuilding it to become a temple, those tears of sadness became great tears of joy and rejoicing. Recently, I had the opportunity to visit the Provo City Center Temple during the open house. The beauty of this building is breathtaking, and although the Spirit of God is found there, I couldn't help but be reminded that the true power comes after its dedication. The work we do in the temple for ourselves and those who have passed from this life is where the true power lies and is the real intent of building temples. This year we have the privilege to study the teachings of President Howard W. Hunter and Relief Society and Priesthood. Although President Hunter was a prophet for only a short time, his impression on me and his love for the temple was great. I clearly remember his admonition for every person to be worthy of and carry a current temple recommend. This symbolized a person's commitment to the Lord, even if distance or life circumstances prevented them from attending as frequently as desired. I think of his foresight as the prophet in preparing a people for a time that would come later under President Gordon B. Hinckley. I recall the day when President Hinckley announced that he had received revelation on how to increase building of temples and to lessen the distance in which people had to travel to get to the temple. President Hinckley explained that the church would, quote, construct small temples, buildings with all of the facilities to minister all of the ordinances, end quote. Since that time, numerous temples have been built. 
So many, in fact, that Elder Quentin L. Cook reported in the April 2014 General Conference that 85% of the church members now live within 200 miles of a temple. As you know, we have been blessed here locally to have two temples within minutes of each other. However, I wonder, too, if our lives become so busy that we forget the great blessing that awaits us just minutes away. The Lord has a great work for us to do in the temple. We just need to be willing to give our time. As we do that, God will bless us abundantly. President Thomas S. Monson shared his thoughts on the blessings that come through the temple. He said, quote, As we enter through the doors of the temple, we leave behind us the distractions and confusion of the world. Inside this sac sacred sanctuary, we find beauty and order. There is rest for our souls and a respite from the cares of our lives. As we attend the temple, there can come to us a dimension of spirituality and a feeling of peace which will transcend any other feeling which could come into the human heart. Such peace can permeate any heart, hearts that are troubled, hearts that are burdened down with grief, hearts that feel confusion, hearts that plead for help." End quote. Every one of us will experience trials, challenges, and heartaches as a part of mortality. But our loving God has given us a place where we can go to leave the world behind and to fill of his love. The temple reminds us of who we once were before this life, what our purpose is on this earth, and what the possibilities for our future life can be. It helps us keep the right perspective in life to not get caught up in the day-to-day -day difficulties, but to remember that this earth life is but a part of God's plans for us. We are reminded that God's plans for us are much grander. His ultimate goal is for us to become like him. Today I shared four beauties of the earth that have helped to shape my life. The beauty of education, the beauty of God's creations, the beauty of scriptures and modern day prophets, and the beauty of temples. However, as I thought of these beauties, many other beauties of the earth that have blessed my life came to mind. I realized that God's beauties of the earth are all around us, and he wants us to find them and to feel gratitude for them. All we have to do is open our eyes to see them or our ears to hear them. We can ask God to help us find and cherish the beauties found in each of our lives. As we do so, we will find joy meaning and purpose in our lives and become ever closer to and more like our loving Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. This devotional address with Raquel Richards was given on February 9th, 2016.